Yes, Kia ora welcome back in here at studio, run it straight, it's round 26 review and if you've joined in and you've watched the weekend's rugby league, it's been a roller coaster and there's been some great wins and some big upset. But first and foremost, before we start our show and bring everyone in, I just want to say a belated happy Father's Day to all our fathers for yesterday. I hope you had a wonderful day and all your kids spoiled you. Uh, also, uh, we did a live stream this morning. Thank you so much for everyone that tuned in and need to go and subscribe to our channels here on Run It Straight. Also, what else is there, guys? Members only coming up, hey, there's a bit of a bunch of guys. I got you guys here. There's a members only page coming through our YouTube channel that's going to be coming very soon to your guys' eyes and ears. So make sure you stay tuned and look out for that one. But anyways, guys, we've got to move on. And it's enough about me. Let's talk about rugby league. Round 26. What do you got for us? Hard. Happy Father's Day to the two dads of the show. You guys, obviously, me and Dills, we're not dads yet. <laughs> That you know of. <laughs> that, or that we know of, yeah. Uh, but we'll hop into the news for the week, starting off with the Super League exits from the NRL. A few been announced this week. Firstly, Kyle Felt is off to St. Helens. Had a mean game against the Storm to celebrate his uh, leaving. But, yeah, how do you feel about him moving on from NRL? Well, yeah, we... probably time. Probably time for him. He's... Just broken the record this season as the Cowboys all-time try scoring record holder. Um, getting a little long in the tooth. Had a great career at the Cowboys. He's obviously from Townsville, born and bred. Come through his childhood club. Won a grand final. Broken all sorts of records as I'm speaking about. Looking to advance his career but, and keep playing. Super League has offered him that opportunity. He's going to a great club in St. Helens. They've always had marquee players like himself going back to Jamie Lyon and even before that, you know, Mal Meninga back in the day, but Jamie Lyon, Matt Gidley, outside backs that have been fantastic for them. Ben Barbara was one of the best players that Super League has seen when he went to St. Helens. He follows in their footsteps and I'm sure he'll be great for them as well. And they're trying to get themselves back up, up the table and, and back up to challenging for grand finals again. They're a little bit further down where they've, where they've been the last couple of years, but... I'm sure signing a quality player like him helps him elevate and, and get back up there again. Been a great servant for the mm. Cowboys. Um, some pretty cool memories too. Obviously his favourite one, I'm guessing, is the 2015 Grand Final and scoring that try in the corner there to equalise the points and then obviously get the win at the end of the day. But um, like you said, getting a little bit older, but also still got so much to give. So I think the opportunity to go to the Super League is very special for himself. Um, obviously the top try scorer for the Cowboys, uh, a since he's been there and has now taken over Matty Bowen. But yeah, I think he's going to do really well over in the Super League. I think he's a great servant of the game and a quality wing at that as well. He's actually on the sly crept all the way up to second try scorer of the season, second top wow. behind Lofi Camparera. Oh, he's not see coming. <laughs> uh, he has 20 on the season. Uh, and then the other two moves to the Super League, both to Hull FC, Aiden Caesar and Jordan Rapps. Uh, both on their way out as well. Yeah, and the Tigers have got Jerome Luai coming in next season to play in the halves. Uh, I think they, they see an opportunity to bring another senior half back in and they're trying to move him out. Um, Lockie Galvin's been outstanding for the Tigers this year. Mm. He'll occupy and be a half with um, Jerome Luai. So, yeah, probably see opportunities coming pretty tough for Aiden Caesar next year, who I dare say is on a good wicket. And to pay someone that much to play reserve grade, probably a bit much for a club like the Tigers. So he's he knows Super League. He's been there, he was at Huddersfield, and then he moved to Leeds before going back to the Tigers. So he knows what he's going to. He knows the competition. He's going to the team that's on the up. Hull FC have got John Cartwright coming in as their coach next season. They're, uh, they've struggled this year badly. They've struggled badly, and they've, they're really trying to recruit hard for John Cartwright to get the team back up. They're a big club, Hull FC. There are, there's two major teams in Hull, in the city of Hull, which is isolated. It's on the east coast of that M62 corridor in in the north of England. Hull FC and Hull KR battle it out. That derby is a true battle. And they're both big clubs now. And Hull KR, they're the pace setters at the moment. They're top of the table and, and killing it this year. Willie Peters has done a great job. And it's been a long time since the gap between the two has been 
to the whole KR advantage as it is right now. So Hull FC, they really want to make a mark and start coming back for John Cartwright and the team, and they start doing that with players like Aidan Caesar. Yeah, he's been. I think Aidan's had a great year at the at the Tigers. Helped support a lot of those young fellas. Lockie Galvin allowed him to play his football. Um, he's a great leader. Like Willie said, he's been over to the UK before in the Super League, so he knows what's expected. Obviously, got a lot of work to do, but uh, someone that could help and guide those those other kids coming through, or some other players around him. Jordan Arpana, um disappointed that Bo can't finish off his his season the way he would like to. Obviously, come off that big major injury. Was also got a broken nose, fractured cheekbone. Fractured, yes. um, he would have loved to stay at Canberra and go to Vegas, um, <laughs> but unfortunately, uh, the Bro doesn't get to Vegas uh, round round one next year for the Canberra Raiders. But what a competitor you're going to get. Uh, you know what you get with Jordan. He's going to turn up. He's going to put his body in. The line he's going to chase everything so i think it'd be a great signing for for them and both signings are great uh and then we'll move on to jermaine hopgood has been extended obviously still out on indefinitely for his back injury that he picked up from that massive tackle by liam martin uh but the eels have extended him until the end of 2027 riles influence again he's uh obviously said yo we're keeping him around is that a good plan? I think so. I think so. I'm a big fan of Jermaine Hopgood's. I was a big fan of Nathan Brown's when he was at the Eels. Just his workhorse style and his uh, no-nonsense type of play. He's taken that mantle and made it better. He's a younger version. Mm. He's got some football about him. He's got some pace and to the point where he had that origin spot earlier this year. So he's got that quality behind him. And whilst he's injured... There is some hope that he can keep that potential and keep fulfilling it for Jason Riles. Still a lot of rumours about players moving on. We spoke this morning about Dylan Brown maybe on the move. They need as much of that core of the team to stay together. Regan Campbell-Gillard's out the door. Looks like he's gone to St George. And so they want to keep a senior player like him who knows the culture and is going to make it even better because I, I love the way he plays. It's, it's a great signing. Yeah, def- definitely a great signing. Um, like like Willie said, just second all Willie stuff. He's, he's got got some great ball playing skills about him. I think he was the highest offload in the comp before he got injured and stuff like that, which earned him his place in the Origin team. He's a worker. He keeps going. He's someone that you need for the middle of the park. You always need those tough guys that are just going to keep turning up. And the way he played this year before he got injured, I thought that's what earns earns him an extension on his contract. So another good little pickup. Riles is trying to get some players together. Leaders are a key. Keeping your spine together is, just, is more important. And then bringing some young development kids in as well is, is a big part of the transition period. So, yeah, great little signing for them, but a lot of work to do. Hopefully we'll see him back from his injury by the start of next season. Um, next up, Jason Demetrio is the new PNG Kumuls. Is that how you say it? Kumuls. 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 Coach. He's their new coach. They've signed him off the back of a couple months break from uh, NRL coaching after he was obviously sacked by the Rabbitohs. Uh, can he help take them to some 2026 World Cup success perhaps? Well, that's the plan, eh, for for J- for Jason Dimitro is to try and build a team to have success for a World Cup. It's like most international coaches right now. The, the goal is the World Cup, which is in 2026. It's about, um, you know, finding those players that are going to help you on their camp- campaign to get you close to winning one. Um, some quality players for the, the PNG team uh, and playing in that Queensland Cup competition up there and then being in there for the last four years. I think they've been going really well. Tough team to play against, especially when you play against them at home. Um, that Jason Dimitro comes in there with um, a lot of NRL experience, um, a quality coach. It's how you're going to get the best out of the Kumul players to be able to turn up and prepare to go after an opposition. Um, but again, you're in, you're, the time is now uh, to start building for for World Cup year, and if they can get some some t- some games together, I think they're in part of the Pacific Championship as well. They play in that, so good little stepping stone for Jason Dimitro to get them ready for World Cup. Yeah, just a lot what Blair is saying about the quality of coach that they get, experienced, um, was a, a successful and assistant coach in the NRL and got his chance at South Sydney. Unfortunately, this year, things uh, went a bit pear-shaped for him and he's found himself out of the game, but it's been a, it's a good pickup for Papua New Guinea. We talk about Samoa and Tonga and the number of players coming through the game now. 
But both in Super League and in NRL, there's a lot of Papua New Guineans coming through too. There's a lot of quality players that he'll have at his disposal to, to select from. And I'm sure with the quality of player coming through for him, they can make, you know, he can make a success of his, his time. Interesting through the week, and we spoke about it before, Justin Olam's comments, you know, as, as a player, a long-serving player, probably their most notable player for Papua New Guinea, bit of frustration um, at the signing of Jason Dimitriou, um, and the frustration stems from coaches coming in and, and sitting in the seat and running the team, but then moving on and leaving the side as soon as an, a, an NRL coaching gig comes up. I get that. I get his frustration. They want a coach that's going to be with them through to the World Cup, through to the campaign and yeah. have some continuity so they're not chopping and changing. And, and that's for Jason Dimitri to decide. You know, if, if they have a success, uh, have a successful campaign in the Pacific Championship and, a, and an offer comes, does he run then? Mm. Does he go and leave them? This is what Justin Olam's about. Just Jason Dimitri might very well do that. I don't know the ins and outs of his contract, but I get that. I get that frustration from from Justin Olam as well. But I'm sure Jason Dimitri will want to see it through to that World Cup. He'll have some long term plans as well as getting this campaign on the way. But overall, a good a good pickup and a good job for Jason Dimitri. A good opportunity for him and a good opportunity for Papua New Guinea Rugby League to have a smart coach leading them through. It's, it's a fair comment Ola makes. Yeah. Because um, as a player, and, and, and I guess as a group of PNG boys, like you'd want to know that this coach is riding and dying with you guys for, for the next part of their journey. Eh? And then when an opportunity comes up, you wouldn't want him just to pack up and leave because, you know, you, you come into your day one camp, the coach comes in and preaches why he's here and what he wants to give to you guys. And then all of a sudden the job comes up and goes, hold on a minute, boys, whatever I just said, I've got to go now. And I get it as a, as a player that you'd want someone there that's going to commit, but I also understand the opportunities that these pathways create. Uh, so it's a tough situation for um, coaches that want to coach in the NRL, but then on the player's side, that is that it's also a tough position for them to be in as well. So it's there's mostly some conflicting things there that don't help both parties, but at the same time, the, t- the person that steps into that coach role has the best interest of the players and as, as, as a, for PNG as well. So it's a hard one. Well, I think Justin Olam's comments come from the fact that yeah. Justin Holbrook left in the end of last season yeah. to go to the Roosters. Once the Roosters came in and he picked up that job, he left Papua New Guinea. You look at the Kiwis, they've got Stacey Jones. He's a Warriors assistant. Yeah. Samoa, Benny Gardner, Penrith assistant, Tonga. Christian Wolf, uh, Dolphins assistant. So it can be done. Yeah. You know, and hopefully if it comes to it and Jason Dimitri does pick up another NRL assistant job and find his way back in that pathway, the club he goes to agrees that he can still do it because yeah. it can be done. It's It's been proven now that it can be done. So that will take away some of the concerns that Justin Olam and I dare say some other players have about the coach just moving on and, and leaving them if a job comes, he can try and juggle both, if that's the case. Mm. Uh, and Justin Holbrook is actually moving on to join the Kangaroos coaching staff with Mel Meninga uh, for this year's Pacific Championships, which, speaking of that, the draw has been announced. Yeah. So, Demetrio Holbrook, they'll all be involved in coaching for, well, various levels of it, obviously four different, I guess, brackets of the championships, the cup and the bowl for both the men and the women. Three teams per each, uh, four countries. This is a pretty epic-sounding tournament, the way that they describe it, and I'm excited. Yeah, I would have loved to see Samoa in that Pacific Cup men's, men's comp, um, to have you know Australia, Tonga, and then Samoa. How mouth-watering would have that been? I think you, you know the key matchup there for, for New Zealand fans is the Tongan matchup here at, at Go Media Stadium, mm-hmm. Mount Smart. Like, that place is going to be Red Sea galore. Like, it's going to be an awesome atmosphere um, to be a part of. If you don't have tickets for that game, man, you are going to be missing out because I don't even know if there'll be any more left because, man, that game is going to be enormous. Something similar to, I guess, the World Cup the year that I was playing and we got beaten by Tonga down at, at Hamilton. Like, 
man, that was rare to see. I can imagine what they're going to do at Go Media Stadium, Mount Smart, because I think the last time they played England there, it was quite similar. I think they beat them. I think they might have beaten them. Did they beat them at Meet Mount Smart? Well, they well, might have been to that close. last play when yeah. Fafita nearly scored yeah. and got stripped down. And... Yeah, yeah. So they got really close that day, and that, that day was red. Um, yeah. So really looking to, um, looking forward to this Pacific Cup and also those, I guess, the Pacific Bowl, both men and women. Um, there's some great footy international football. And, and this for us as former players of our country, like this is the pinnacle for our boys. Um, so to be able to represent your country, uh, play against some quality opposition, like it's 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 exciting. It's an exciting time of the year, that, that October month and the start of November. And just unfortunate, Willie. They got paid more money to go over to uh, the UK <laughs> and uh, play against the English boys. But um, yeah, maybe one day we'll have the Samoans back there too and it'll be a four nations. And that's I think that's should be back in the calendar real soon. Yeah, it'll be exciting. I'm glad we're talking about International Rugby League. And I think uh, I've said it time and time again, there's a hunger for more parts of the game. Fans, players, coaches, everybody mm. wants to see international rugby league and everybody understands the need for our game to have international rugby league thrive and be on its pedestal and grow that's how the game grows globally we can't hold it within and gatekeep it just to ourselves here in the nrl it's got to be spread it's got to be spread around the world and this is what i love about the last world cup having greece and jamaica in it uh, mm -hmm. this will Surely bring the crowds, we tease up at the Mount Smart <laughs> Stadium, no doubt. And it will be, as you said, it'll be a, it'll be a sea of red um, come Go Media Stadium and it'll be exciting. And I'll be on the other side of the continent, of the world and the other hemisphere and working for Samoa, but I'll be looking down here with excitement and, you know, at, at what we could be part of going yep, forward. Definitely. I just can't wait to see uh, Adam Fanua Blake take a hit up with all the Tongan fans, all the oh. Warriors fans all watching him. He's no longer a warrior, man. That would the, be epic. The Tongan him will be going crazy. <laughs> but it'll, be, it's, it'll be just so cool to be a part of, you know what I mean? Like, I look back on my time as a former player and that, that Hamilton game stands out as one of the uh, a great memory, not only because, um, you know, of the fans that turned up and the, I think the the noise of the Tongan singing their hymn, and it was so nice. Um, but that's what rugby league's about, eh? That's what international rugby league's about, is bringing our cultures or our people together, our countries together, and displaying what we represent and who we represent. So I'm looking how, forward to this. How was that, to be playing at home, but feeling like you're not at home? Like, for, for me... It's 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 the get the, the game brings the people together, right? That, and, and and I feel like that like it's us on the field that have brought all these people together. And no matter where it's your home game or away game, they're there to support the game of rugby league and support their people. So I thought um, a, a great moment and opportunity to go out do the haka and then also hear the Tongans sing their hymn. Like it's so cool. I think it's um, it's rugby league at its finest. It is it is hard. But at the same time, man, what a what a place to be. Like you don't want to be anywhere else to run out to a stadium full of the opposition's fans. And I've played in grand finals where you've run out there and it's like, oh, you know, when I was at the storm, where, where's the purple jerseys? There is nothing. It was all yellow when I played in 09 against the, the Parramatta Eels. And I'm just like, but those are the games you want to be involved in. Those are the memories you'll keep forever. And that's still in my mind from the time that we played it. And then obviously brings back more memories now that hey, it's going to be the same when we get to go media stadium and we play against the Tongan team again. I right, just got one more question for you. On that day, as the Kiwi team are there and the Tonga team go in their huddle and Tom Alolo comes through yeah. the middle, how yeah. was that seen? Well, that was that was the whole hype around that. Yeah, eight. yeah. So it's Jace um, deflects from from New Zealand, selected deflects there, and the whole hype was around Jason Tom Alolo and his deflection of New Zealand. But that was going to be the moment that everyone... Yeah, and they jumped in, yeah. made a big thing about it, and and that was most probably the moment where you just go, "Oh, this is," you know what I mean? This is why they do what they do, you know what I mean? Because this is what it means to them. Uh, for us, and, and for me being a part of obviously the Kiwi team and being, this is our haka, you know what I mean? Like this is the challenge that they said. It was I saw it as a challenge for us to go out there and show, hey, what whatever happens on this day, it's going to be a memorable day for both teams, but. You've got to you got to face it front. You got to face it front on, and 
the chair, you know, and that's what it was. And it'll be the same when you go to Mount Smart this year. Like the chair's going to be crazy no matter who comes up out of the middle. And I think the best person to do it would be Adam Fanua Blake. Hometown, like he's been here for the last few years. And for Adam Fanua Blake to come out of the middle of that, man, it, the crowd will go nuts. Oh. And I think um, something that for the Tongans to think about would be someone like that, you know what I mean? Like Adam has had, um, he's put up his roots here in New Zealand for the last few years. And as a proud Tongan player, and I think he would be out there and he could do something similar and have the same feeling as what they had on that day that yeah. they could have coming forward in the Go Media. Great theatre. Yeah, Great that's theater. what it's all about, eh? Like, this is International Rugby League at its best. Like, this is why we play the game of rugby league. This is why we play for our countries, is to represent our people and put it on the big stage where everyone can watch and be a part of something special. So, yeah, what a game of rugby league. Obviously, being a coach for New Zealand, when can we expect oh. these teams being named for all of the different Well, as, as the competition comes to the end, like around last weekend, this week, people get tapped on shoulders about the train-on squad because everyone's still in contention, you know what I mean? Like, you don't know what's going to happen in the in the final eight. Uh, people can get injured. We've just seen, mm-hmm. uh, you know, Brandon Smith. Um, he's always been a part of the Kiwi, Kiwi teams in, in the past, so he may be out if there's an ACL injury in there. So you never know. People still have to work hard uh, in this off season, or will in the last couple of weeks before the teams are named. And you know those boys that will play finals football will go close to playing in the squad, and the rest will just be training in the background. So the team doesn't get named till the week after the grand or the week of the grand final. I think what's the grand final played on the Sunday or Sunday, and then I think Wednesday or Thursday the team will officially be named. So. It's exciting times, exciting times. Yeah, watch this space. You never know. Run it straight, mate. Ooh. Might be doing some stuff uh, in Should the international drop space. But... Drop the team list, you reckon? <laughs> <laughs> Both Samoa and New Zealand right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, last bit of news for this week is this craziness that's happening at the Tigers with the Balmain and uh, West's proposed split up. There was all that news coming out that Balmain, oh, we want nothing to do with them anymore. Yeah. Let's split apart. And then uh, Danny Stapleton, the chairman for Balmain, has come out and said, what are these guys talking about? I don't know what that is. And it's just a whole, like, massive biff up everywhere in the news that they all hate each other, but actually they don't. It's just worse news for the Tigers, I think. Well, this is the problem. I feel like this is, has been the problem for a while is these guys can't make up their minds of what they want to do, whether they're going to split and go their own separate ways or stay connected and stay together. Why come out in the media and say you're going to split in the first place if someone comes back and says, no, nah, no, nah, that wasn't supposed to be said, like we want to work together. I think the more the noise at the top, we say it doesn't affect, but it filters down through the, the group and then into the players. Uh, so the more they can keep their mouths closed and sort it out behind closed doors. And before it's actually true, don't say anything till it's actually true because the media will grab this over in Sydney and just put it all out there for everyone to hear. And it affects everyone um, because obviously they're a big part of the West Tigers, both Balmain and West. So they need to make sure that they do things properly rather than put it out in the media, which has been the Tigers forever. Uh, It's always a conversation in the media about the Tigers and what they're doing. And this is a basket case. Uh, let's just try and get back to focusing on footy for those guys. They don't need the noise. They don't need the distractions. They've got some great kids down there. Don't be feeding these kids anything else that they don't need to, but teaching the game of rugby league because some great talent in there and it will be disappointing to see this thing filter through, but it's already already disappointing that it's out in the media, you know? So make up your mind, keep it bloody clay behind closed doors and get it sorted. Yeah, I, Larry's 100% right. The culture of an organisation and of a club starts at the top and the infighting and the indecisions that they've gone on for years and sacking off CEOs Mm. and changing board members hasn't helped. It has not helped or given the club any opportunity to gain any cohesion as a club and it's always been fractured. As long as there's fracture at the top, as Blairy said, it filters down and it's hard for Benji as the coach to manage Mm. some of that as much as you're driving standards and driving a culture that you want to see of togetherness and excellence, if that's happening at the top and the players are seeing that, which they are, and it's coming in the papers, that affects the product on the weekend. That affects how the players are. There's always questions around. So the board need to sort themselves out. The board need to get together and either split up and go their own ways 
which I don't think they will because mm. one of them will miss out on an NRL licence then or mm. both good or just get on and get on with harmony because the only time they've had success is when they've won that grand final ever since then and you know, and before that it's just been infighting and arguing and it, and it affects the playing group. You know, they've got a young playing group mm. that needs some real strong leadership and Benji needs some help as an, an, an experienced coach. So they've got to sort that out at the top. That wasn't good that news coming out, and I'm glad they've sorted it out, and I hope they have honestly sorted and, and men, make an, made amends and worked through the preseason to help Benji support the team. Talk about timing as well, with one game left, and if they win, they get How off good. the bottom spoon. If they lose, they get the, the wooden spoon. That's just... <laughs> we, we did say it will come down to round 27, <laughs> eh? We did say it will come down to round 27, and how good would that be to watch, so... Hey, everyone will be on the edge of the seat on, <laughs> what is it, Sunday? Do they play on Father's Day again? Uh, I think that one's actually on Friday. Oh, it would have been nice if it was played on Father's Day again, Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, speaking of the games, we'll hop into the games for this weekend, uh, starting off with the Cowboys versus Storm at Queensland Country Bank Stadium, 38-30 to to the Cowboys. How did the Cowboys win? The stats all telling us that they were the worst team by far. The commentators were saying the whole time about like nine line breaks to three, stuff like that. And somehow the Cowboys managed to win by eight points. Yeah, um, this one kept me up on a Thursday night and um, struggled to find my sleeping routine after that over the weekend <laughs> because of footy. Um, you know, we love the game so much, we end up getting stuck up, till, <laughs> getting stuck up till midnight watching these fellas play. Um it was an exciting game for me, uh, and I stayed up because it was so exciting. And for me, uh, my thought was wanting to watch the next crop of Melbourne players come through and how they were going to react under a bit of adversity and pressure. But you knew, I, I felt like I knew how they were going to turn up. Uh, a team that just gets their job done no matter who they are and who's in or out. Uh, didn't help by losing Ryan uh, Pappenhausen early in that game. Uh, and then I think... The way that obviously the Cowboys won was just a little bit more class at the end of the day. It wasn't to, uh, you know, the lack of effort from the Melbourne Storm because I thought they turned up and went after the game. Like, you know, 38-30, although you're disappointed in the result, you're still happy because I think they were down to two people on the bench for most most of that game. And some of those uh, deputants played much really more minutes or a lot of those players on the field played more minutes than they ever had to. Um, but the credit to the Melbourne Storm that they keep producing these talent that just come through and just get their job done. But the Cowboys, no matter how you win it, uh, you know, win one point, 38 points, you know, two points, it's a win. Uh, it sets them up for, you know, the back end of their season and their finals. I thought they were, they were, weren't a class above. They just got lucky in the end there. A couple of bounces of the ball, um, you know, some good tries scored. But, you know, the Melbourne Storm... Could, if they had all their t players on the field, Levin rested, like that's huge, bro. That's making a statement. Um, I think, you know, a long time ago, Craig Bellamy was the first one to start resting players. Now it's just become a tradition that most teams do it at this time of the year, if they're able to. And he managed to rest 11 players in the end. And the players that turned up on that field on Thursday night against the Cowboys, they're all quality players too. You know, Wishart is getting an opportunity. There's no way he can't not, cannot be in that team, no matter what position he plays. He's Mr. Fixer, and I heard Craig talk about him and how important he is to the team. He just gets it done. Um, so some quality players, some great signs. Um, that's why they sit at the top of the table. Although they lost, they'll be happy with some of the efforts of a lot, a lot of the new players coming through. Yeah, well, with all the changes that the Storm made, you still had an idea that they would come out and play to that system, such are their standards. And the young fellas that came in, will try and seize the opportunity to impress mm. the coach. Mm -hmm. If not, just for the upcoming playoffs and an opportunity to be involved if an injury or somebody goes down or somebody falls out of form, they put their hand up. You knew they were going to do that or for next season coming to say to the coach. And it's a bit like Joe Chan did last year. He got one, one game, blew it out in the 15, 20 minutes that he played and was afforded a lot more opportunities and now a new contract. So these guys that came in, they knew that was the case. They had to grab it with two hands, and they did. Was it Lissati, the back row who scored? At the end. Yep. At the Lissati. end. What a try. <laughs> what a <laughs> Boy, try. T. From Big Penrith. bloke out on the right-hand side, 
busts a couple of tackles and then beats the fullback with some pace, comes back on the inside, 30 metres out. Outstanding try. And that's the standard of that he's got to uphold, that the players before him, Cartois was doing that. Yep. That's what he's got to come in and, and replicate some of that. The Cowboys had enough quality about them. They had the better side out. And I thought the score flattered them, as you said. They got a couple of bounces of the ball, especially when Nano scores yep. that try, mm -hmm. bounces back into his yep. arms and he scores. And um, Valentine Holmes kicks the penalty to take it out to 38, yep. and flatters them a little bit. The concern for me is whilst they solidified their position in the top eight now with that win, the Cowboys, they're not going to play that sort of side in the playoffs. They're going to come up against teams with their full complement of players. They're mm -hmm. going to play NRL sides, you know, and that could really trouble them. The, they'll be thinking about that. They should have put that that team that Melbourne rolled out to bed. But good on Craig Bellamy. Good on him. There were some knockers about him resting players, but they earned that right. Mm. They earned, he earned that right with his side that he's put out this year by being the minor premiers with two weeks to go to rest his side. So now they get a rest this week. He'll probably roll out his full side against yep. Brisbane this week yep. in, in hopes of getting them ready for Fine. the playoffs. And if they win that game, they get another rest. So they're primed. They're in the prime position, you know, being able to rest the players at the right time, get them energised and fresh to really attack and go for that grand final spot. Um, good on – they didn't win the game, but I thought they won in spirit. Yeah. Um, for you, Adam, the Lasati try and the – Lazarus Valepu try. Yep. The whole time we, well, when I was watching the game and I saw first Valepu early score the try and then Lasati, it reminded me of a young Adam Blair. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I was just thinking, man, were you were you like that when you were younger, Adam? When you first got introduced, were you like the man and just scored a try straight away? Nah, mate. I only scored 12 tries in my whole career <laughs> in my 15 years. But um, like I would have... I always would have been nervous. I made a break like that. I wouldn't have known what to do. You know what I mean? Like again, like it's it's a big play and a big moment for someone that's just new into the mm. NRL uh, and making a debut is to draw the fullback first and foremost. You get taught to you know draw and pass. Yeah. Uh, and that's the first thought that comes into your mind. He looks out there. He dummies. Yeah. He dummies the ball and goes himself. And that could go either two ways. It could either get tackled off the ball or you know he could pass it and they could score a try. But he dummies backs himself and goes and scores that try. Um, I would have been too nervous about to make those breaks. But they are some young kids coming through and. The systems down there, it just it allows these kids to come out there and just do their jobs. And that's the main thing is what you saw with those players that come into the team. Every single player got their job done and the bounce of the ball, that's rugby league. It's, you know, and I think for the Cowboys, it's the, the, the number of points scored for me. is that you're going into finals in and, and a week's time that 30 points isn't going to be good enough to be, to, to be able to let any team score because, you know, a team like Willie said that has 11 players out, you should have been able to put them away. Um, so they're going to have to sort out the defence. You take the win now and you get out, get on to next week and f sort out what you need to get right. But defence is going to win this premiership and they're going to have to be better than that. Yeah, so just talking about Melbourne's quality and system, a lot of their system is based around effort. Mm. About beating the opposition to the ball. And talking about Tyron Wishart, who I thought was mm. one of the best on the field, scored a try from the base of the scrum, throwing a dummy over Reed by Jeremiah Nano, and he goes through. But his second try was about effort. The Cowboys tried to do a short drop yep. kick. Griffin Neem can't control it, Kicks but he's got through. more about him and more will to get to the ball, kicks it through and gets a second try. That's an effort play. That's a try on effort more than anybody else on the field. And that's what he did on the night, but what Melbourne were about and are about. And he's just always up for it, eh? Like, he, I swear he's always got a smile on his face. He's like Hammer when he goes on those massive runs. Whenever he, uh, Wishart is, like, close to the line, he loves just whipping out a step yeah. dummy, stuff like that, and he's always just smiling, and then he scores a try. He, he plays that way every week. Like, mm -hmm. you, you pretty much know what you're going to get from him. Whether he plays... Centre, fullback, half, hooker, wing, wing. It's this. It gives you the same effort, and that's what Willie Rick says is that a lot of their game is based around effort, and that's what most of those play. All those players were did the other night is they turned up with the effort and the attitude to try and get that win because for the 
the club, not knowing or knowing that they've got 11 out, didn't really change anything for them. They wanted to go out there and get a put a performance in that they could be proud of. Although they didn't win, they'd be proud of those efforts. Um, for I said before, for Carl Felt when we talked about him leaving, obviously has just shot up to second. He has 20 tries. Lofi Camperera on 23. The Titans aren't going to make the playoffs. Is there a chance that Kyle Felt could end his career in the NRL being the top try scorer? Because obviously they've got one game left, then they'll have at least a preliminary final. Titans have one game left, but as we saw, we'll talk about it later, they got smashed. Yeah, yeah I think he could go past. Lofi needs to score about four tries in the last game just to solidify that top try scorer. But... I think Kyle Feltz can, can get past them, yeah. What a shock that would we, be. We, I didn't think we would have saw that one coming at all. He's, at got, all. he's got nine tries in his past five games. <laughs> enormous, enormous, bro, enormous. Uh, moving on to the next game, Bulldogs versus the Sea Eagles at Accor Stadium. Uh, 34-22 to the Sea Eagles. I didn't see it coming, to be honest. I thought the Bulldogs, they had won, I think, nine and ten of their last games and they just kind of got blown off the park by Manly. I always think, you know, round 26 was, uh, for me, it was the, the team that wanted it the most. Um, and I'm not saying the dogs didn't want this, but I just feel like most of the football I watched over the weekend is the teams that wanted to win or wanted to turn up with the right attitude, got the game and got the win. And I think with the Seagulls game, and I didn't see it coming either, you know, the key players stood up at the right times of the game. Obviously, Cherry Evans is a big part of that Seagulls team. And when he can control a team around the field and he can change momentum of the, just with the kick of the boot, a ball, you know what I mean? And then and then you got Tom Trevojevic who went off with, uh, what did he go off with? He had an shoulder. HIA, but HIA. He stayed off. Yeah, shoulder. Shoulder. which, off which I'm hoping that it's okay because I feel like without him, I just the threat that he has when he carries the ball and the threat that he has at the back of block shape is important to to what the Seagulls do. But again, come up against a, a, a Bulldogs team who are going, they were going for six straight wins and most probably the most consistent team over the last, you know, 10 weeks, I thought, with the way that they've been playing. Um, you would have thought that they were going to get this one just with, again, that when I speak about effort, these guys, that's what they play on. They play on effort, but I think, you know, the, the Seagulls put it on them and put it on them early, and that's what you have to do with the Bulldogs is when a team, if you allow them to play football, kick out Burton, uh, they come out and they play Crichton. Well, Crichton was sitting on the sideline, sorry. Um, they, they, they play how they want to play and they allow them to play. So Seagulls were, were good. They were good. I've seen it too many times uh, in my lifetime. Teams that score real early mm. get mowed down. And so even though the dog scored without Manly even touching the ball after about a minute and 30, I think, Red Marnie goes over. The two ways it can go here. You can either get complacent, which I, I thought was the case, and the opposition get their back up and come at you, or you just keep going on with it, and that wasn't the case, unfortunately, for the dogs. Manly just stepped up. I, th I thought Homole Olukweatu was big and strong, both in attack and defence. Um, young Merrin found out just how strong he can tackle. Mm. That was a tackle and a half when he he smashed him to the ground. Um, the other one I've been impressed with with Manly, we're talking about Cherry Evans and Trebojevic. And I, I thought he'd be a good signing for them, but Luke Brooks... Mm. Um, has been an absolute godsend for Cherry Evans and been outstanding this season. You know, I, I think he's found some career best form and we've spoken about it throughout the course of the season when a player's happy and just how much better they play and he looks really comfortable and happy, come out with some fantastic plays for them individually but as a foil and as a halves partner for Cherry Evans, he's been great for them. And he's just starting to see Trubojevic learn how he's playing, where to run off him and where to be. Um, it could be a miss. It could be a, a disappointing one for him. But the Dogs really miss Crichton. They, they missed his leadership at vital moments in this game. They finished the, ball, finished the game strong and they started to move the ball out to the edges. Mm. But uh, another one who I think has been great for Manly, could be a shout for Rookie of the Year, is Lehi Opoati. Mm -hmm. Being awesome. Yeah, being Some awesome. of those tries. And try saving. Yeah. Yes. He cut down um, at a car there to put him into touch. He's 
scoring tries for fun and doing it on both sides of the coin. Great, great player. Great one for the future. He doesn't look like a big winger either. Doesn't look anything like his dad. It's real skinny. Yeah. But f- but fast. Fly. Fly. He can move. Yeah. He can move the kid. He doesn't even look like his brother, Albus. They look, they look. Yeah, they're all different. All will. Yeah, Will's all different. Like all different body shapes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, really good player. I thought he was. He, I thought he did well. Red Money was a bit of a piss in that game too, getting after <laughs> it, scoring some tries. But yeah, um, again, I, I heard um, the coach talking about the game, uh, and these are much of the games before you get to the finals. That you know how you say you don't want to lose any games, eh? But you'd rather lose them now than come to the finals football in a week's time or two weeks' time, and then lose one of those games. So you get a bit of a a false sense of where you're sitting on the competition of your your uh, playing your playing style. It, it gives you an opportunity to go and strip back some of what you think you've been able to get away with. And this is hard. When you're going on five straight, everything seems to just be going really well. You're a well-oiled team and you go through them, you go through every single thing and you don't, you may overlook a couple of little things that may creep into this one. This one will allow them this loss will allow them to strip it right back and go, all right, this is what we did right, this is what we did wrong, and we need to do this better all the time. But yeah. taking a loss now is better than taking a loss come come two weeks' time. So I think he's, although he's not happy with the performance, I think quietly you'd rather take that now than later. Do you guys think that if this game had have been after the Sharks and the Roosters games, obviously Sharks and Roosters both lost, the motivation would have been there for the Bulldogs more so because they could have gone into the top four? No, I don't think so because, like, I don't know, your players do see where they sit on the table and um, you play with what's in front and you play the game at head and then whatever happens, happens, you know what I mean? So I don't, it doesn't give you any more motivation that you have to, well, that these guys, if they lose, that you go in front of them. It's just like you've got to... You've got to be consistent in your own performance. You've got to turn up to win that game. Uh, you can't worry about what's happening around you because then you're allowing outside noise to control your thinking. Hey, eh? so your focus is first and foremost the game at hand, making sure that you're well, well prepared and well ready to go. And this is the result sometimes is a little bit people like you said, a bit of a false sense of how their game's going to go. You score real early. I've been in those games too. Score early, and then the other team just comes back over the top of you, and you just go, "Oh, geez, what happened?" And by then, it's too late to come back and go get into your grooves. You know, like Willie said, started shifting the ball. That's kind of their style early in the game. The mission we just thought they're just going to go through the middle of the park and go through them, but Manly were too strong. Yeah, I'd, if that was the case, that could have been different for another game that we're going to talk about in a second. Brisbane could have taking some motivation after seeing St George lose. Mm-hmm. But that's not the case. As Blair is saying, you build up all week just for this game. You focus on this game. They focus on Manly. Nothing outside is going to influence or change your game plan or your focus on how you play that game. Now, I don't think they would have thought too much about the other result. That wouldn't have driven them any more than what they should have been anyway going into the game. Uh, the Sea Eagles injuries, obviously, you said about Turbo. He is going to be out next week, but he's supposed to be back for the preliminary finals. Uh, not so lucky for Saab. He did his ankle. I think he's out for the season either way. I don't think he'll be back no matter oh, if they make it to the grand final or not, which means also he's going to miss the race. There you go, bro. Wipe so it now. That's pretty sad. The race. I told you, bro. It won't go ahead. <laughs> it won't go ahead. I didn't see this coming, but it won't go ahead. But that does give uh, Lehigh, obviously, the opportunity. He'll probably be the fullback, yeah. you'd imagine. Uh, and I guess they'll have another spot on the wing. Cola before. could be back. Yeah, yeah Cola played off the bench uh, in that game, which was another <laughs> similar to Selwyn Cobo for the Maroons. Good, mm. good timing to have him there. But are those injuries, I mean, obviously, Turbo one week, not too concerning, but could that cost the Seagulls greatly, do you think? Well, Turbo, all good. He can have a rest and go again. I think um, Saab, I think I think he plays an important role for for the Manly Seagulls, even although he's a winger, and I don't like wrapping up wingers because the other way there was a score tries. But Cherry Evans plays to him a lot, and his speed you cannot coach. You give him an inch either side, he can beat you on the outside of you every single time. And I know that he's a big part of what Manly do. And when you watch him, Cherry Evans likes to get him involved in the game and he can score tries from anywhere over the field just with his speed. Uh, so I think um, like he's going to be missed. 
but they do have some good, really good speed to replace him with. So I just think he's a, 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 a target for jumping and contesting in the air, um, but then his speed as well. So those are the, the two different things, but I do think they do play a lot to his strength, which is his speed. You know, you put a kick through and you got someone that runs the way he does, like, man, he is a target. So I think that may affect them a little bit, but also think that they've got some young kids coming through that can get a job done. Yeah, and Leo Opwati ended up scoring mm. a try on that right-hand side anyway. So they'll have a replacement to the same quality of of Saab. Not too sure that's to be seen, but um, while you're talking about Cherry Evans, he came up with one of my plays of the weekend, that 40-20, which is like a 42. <laughs> and, you know, from the other side mm. of the field, from the long side, usually you, if yeah. you're going to kick it on your left, you're going to kick it from the left of halfway through the field. But he was on the right-hand side of the field, swung it back and Connor Tracy could not get to the ball. The connection that he got, the spot, the read, what a kick from Cherry Evans, 35 years old and still pulling that sort of stuff out of the bag. Just an amazing play that threatens opposition teams in the playoffs because yeah. those are big plays. Mm -hmm. He comes up with some of those plays in the playoffs. They could change games. They could change seasons. Well, yeah, every second week he does. We've seen him do it in Origin on the, under the pump. You know, made 25 metres and then he just goes bang on four and kicks a 40-20 and it just changes the whole momentum of the game. And every second week, I reckon he's got a 40-20 in him where he changes the momentum when you're under the pump. And guys like him, like you said, what, 34, 35, that can still, has a, I guess as you get older, you have a great awareness of field position and where you are on the field. But it also helps to have really good forwards around you too to get you forward and get you in those momentums. But you'd think... You know, as a fullback, you'd, you you'd might be able to defend stuff like that. But, man, those kicks are, like, inch perfect. Like, they move and they get some right every time. I haven't seen him kick it out on the full. Most times he goes for that early 40-20, he gets it every time, and that's what he does, man. But, yeah, like you think, like you said, Willie, I think that could be the difference in, in these final games for sure. Last one on this game, the Bulldogs next week, obviously, get back Critter uh, from his suspension, but they'll be losing Bronson Cherry to another suspension and Matt Burden is going to have to sit on the sideline as well because of his HIA. I feel like they might, it's a possibility that they lose that game as well and then it's a bit of a fizzle out. Uh, last week, obviously, Willie said he could see in a world that the Bulldogs made the finals. Do you still think that that could be the case? Well, they, they play at home. They play at home, which this year has been enormous for them. They've, their crowd, their fans have come and supported them. They're playing a great style of football. I think Matt Burton here, he didn't get a Category 1, so he just has to pass symptom tests during the week, so he could be back out there on the field. Did he not get it? No, he didn't get a Category 1. So he got he went off with concussion, uh, but they just failed him, but that wasn't a Category 1. So he could, if he gets through all his protocols, he could be playing. Um, Crichton coming back is a huge in uh, at home. Um, he is their strike on the edge, and they play to him all the time alongside Billy Um Cherry, I think he's been, you know, it's his first year back, and he's gone from strength to strength. He's been out of the game for a long time, uh, but he's come in, and, you know, they'll they'll lose him on that edge. I think they're, they're strike out of both their edges. Uh, but you would think on the back of their performance that they had against the Seagulls playing at home, they would go up another gear because they need to. Um, you can't, you don't want to have two losses in a row going into finals because it doesn't do much for the confidence, eh? A one-week suspension or one-week injury, we're talking about Trebojevic, isn't too bad at this time. We're talking about Melbourne being able to rest a whole bunch of players. Yep. You could see it that way. Mm. You could see it as Crichton. He got a good rest this week. Yeah. He got an opportunity yeah. to get out of the firing line whilst they lost. And they want to be winning. He's still going to have the freshness about him. He's got a chance to rejuvenate and come back and attack the finals after this weekend. So you could see it like that. Whilst Burton will, might be off this weekend, if he isn't, then fine, he gets to play. But if he is out and he gets to rest, you can guarantee he'll be fresh coming back the week after. They can they take the positive out of it out of it that way. Mm. Next game up: Panthers versus Rabbitohs at Bluebet Stadium. <coughs> Panthers won 34-12, managed to stabilize after their back-to-back -back losses. Mm. But I think the story of this game: Tyrone Munro. Uh, man, that was a pretty beautiful Tough scene week. after the after the game with his family because obviously, yeah, as you say. Yeah, the poor kid had a tough week. What did he lose someone early and then lose someone again in the space of, you know, a few days? Uh, for any player to, to 
to get on the field going through those tough times, man, you got to give the kid credit um, because he could have easily just gone, nah, nah, I can't, I can't because mentally I'm just not there and, and you wouldn't judge him on anything to, in his circumstances of what he's gone through. But to turn up and play the way he did, uh, he's a great player. Uh, you know, haven't seen him enough this year. I think he was injured, I think, a bit through the season. But when he plays footy, um, he can play footy. And you've seen that try, his speed. He's crazy. Um, but a credit to him and his family to be able to give him the support and to be able to give him, get him on that field to play footy. Because at the end of the day, you know, footy it kind of fixes most things for you when you're around your teammates and around your mates and you kind of take your mind off other things at the same time and I'm just glad he managed to get out there and play a great game for for his his family as well. Uh, the Penrith Panthers, there hasn't been too many times that they've gone back-to-back -back losses or even gone three losses in a row and you most probably thought that, you know, come against a, a, a South team that they were going to be far more superior and obviously Luai is starting to come into his own because he has to have... Um, the same, same as, uh, as IAO, he has to be playing really good footy. They're coming into a time of the season now where those are your three, two key men alongside Nathan Cleary when he's there to be able to lift the spirits of the people around you. Fisher Harris, the last, I think, since he's come back from injury, he's been strong with his carries and his performances, scored a couple of tries, I think, back-to-back -back weeks. Um, just around just supporting as a front row and for all those front rows out there, just keep supporting, <laughs> keep supporting for the middle of the park. There's not many times they get one-on-one -on -one tries uh, near, the tri near the try line. So, no, nah, great effort from the Panthers. They really needed this to, to um, put them in a, a better, I guess, confidence, give them more confidence that they can get these wins um, up against a team that they should have beaten anyway. Um, they clearly will be happy with that, but still a lot of work, work ons. Yeah, I'll just take the opportunity to pass on our condolences from Run It Straight to Tyron Munro and his family and fantastic to see the support that uh, the club and the game have given him. Um, tough, tough to, to roll out after the week that he had and let alone put in a performance like he did. But uh, yeah, you find strength sometimes, mm. as Blair is saying, just being out there, being in the dressing room and being amongst friends and being out. It's, uh, it's a safe place. Sometime for for players being out on the field, it's your it's your comfort place, and I think he found some of that on the weekend. And hopefully um, things go well for him, and he, we wish him all the best. But yeah, as the Panthers, back to some of their best individually. Mm. Individually, I thought Sunia Taruva was good. Um, Brian Toto, <laughs> that break that he made up the middle, just back to his running best. Even when he scored that try. You know, just powerful, changing angles and his his body movement at pace, just so strong. You know, and the determination to get over the line. Um, Jerome Lua was outstanding. I I really loved the play when Fisher Harris scored. I, the thing I loved about it was when Isaiah Yo plays at the line, and too often when middles try to play it, you get into your head that you're going to pass, so you turn your body, and what that does to you. It, it, takes away your ability to keep running when the opportunity presents itself. So what Isaiah Yo did, he played square and he looked at the next defender and once he saw him go, he just gassed it and went straight through. He showed the dummy about a second before, but he played straight, got through, got through just enough to pass to James Fisher-Harris to score, as you said, his second try of the week. But... Not too sure if it was on purpose, that little grubber kick from James Fisher-Harris. <laughs> it worked out for him. It worked out for him. They got it back to one and, and got the ball back in their hands. But uh, I don't know what Nathan Cleary will say, will say about that one. But it worked for him. It may have been a, a tactic to get a front rower to kick the ball. But, yeah, he's doing everything at the moment, Fish. But, yeah, good win for the Panthers. Good win for them to uh, get back up to second spot. It's not uh, theirs yet. They're not owning second spot. But that home game... The home game, either for one and two or for five and six, are really, really important. Mm -hmm. who, who do you reckon you want to play first week? If you're, what are you, the Sharks, Roosters, uh, Melbourne and Panthers? You want to play the Roosters now. <laughs> you want to play the Roosters yeah, yeah, right yeah. now. Yeah, definitely. Mm. So, but the, so the Roosters, if the Roosters, are they second? No, nah, their points difference, they're third now. So they're third. Yeah. So one plays four, two plays three. Oh, yeah. You want to play the Roosters with the people that they have out for mm. sure. Panthers without Nathan Cleary, you know what I mean. So who's sitting in the box seat? Melbourne Storm, hey, happy days, all fresh. 
all fresh, eleven players rested. How good? Let's be honest, they're going to dispatch of the of the sharks um, for the for the Rabbitohs in this game. Before we talk too much about previewing <coughs> some more, uh, Jack Wyden injured his calf, uh, possibly season over for him. Not too much for that. Obviously, they only have one game left, but. It's just been one of those seasons. It's kind of sums up, right? Obviously, he moved to the six after, especially us. I, we were begging for them to move him, right? And it was your guys' idea. They did move him. <laughs> it kind of changed their fortunes. Him and Latrell Mitchell and Cody Walker kind of got it going. But, yeah, this was kind of like just a fizzle out of the Rabbitohs season overall, eh? Yeah, due, due to form and individuals and then all the outside noise of coaches moving Jack White and getting into the six where he should have been, uh, you know, and having Latrell there for a bit. Looked like they were changing a few things and obviously Latrell getting injured um, kind of took away all the fizz of what's going on at South. Um, they managed to fight really hard at the back end of the season and and put some respect back, in, back into the jersey, into the club, I thought. Uh, but the off-field noise has been the worst thing for me uh, for the South. And obviously Cam Murray sitting on the sideline who has put his heart and soul into their place alongside. I think Jack White has been good for them as well once he's moved into the six. But just too much um, outside noise. And, you know, they'll have a look at themselves over the next few months before they start again. And, you know, having big Wayne Bennett there to see how that all works out. Yeah. Uh, be good to see them back to their best again and having some, putting some smiles on some of those fans' faces and also the players and encourage them to play some footy. Yeah, I don't think next Monday could come soon enough mm. for the Rabbitohs. They just want to see the back of 2024. As you say, they want to just get Wayne in there and come in, make make the changes you need to make, make the make the players feel good again through preseason, and let's get on with 2025 because, uh, yeah, this has been one to forget for them. Um, moving on to the next game, Eels versus Dragons at Combank Stadium. 44-40 to 40 to the Eels. Man, the Eels tried their hardest to lose that game in the last 10 minutes, but they still managed to, you know, stave it off right at the end, winning by four points. The biggest ever losing scoreline of any team in NRL history, 40 points. Um, what a crazy game. <laughs> Well, it wasn't crazy till the last, like, 12 minutes, really. Yeah. You know what I mean? The game was gone. It was gone, and uh, it was poor from the Dragons. Um, they just, some of the tries, I think Dylan Brown was having a field day, and some of the tries were just soft contact, you know what I mean? Like, he played short to a couple of his players there a few times, and just soft contact. And that was it. It was attitude, and that's what I mean about... Like teams this weekend, I felt like the attitude, some teams were better. And again, you take talk about the attitude of the last, you know, 12 you know, minutes for the Eels. They just clocked off because they thought that was enough. We'd done enough. In any game, you'd most probably say, yeah, sweet, bro. I'd, I'd be, I think that's why they put Clint Gutherson on the sidelines. It's like, brother, no more, bro. We'll say before the Wooden Spoon game next week, you know, it's more important that one. The Spoon Grand the Final. The Spoon Grand Final. You know what I mean? <laughs> so they put him on the sidelines thinking, oh, we're home and hopes here. And then all of a sudden... Ben Hart starts playing a bit of footy. They start shifting around the ball. They start offloading. They start putting kicks in behind the team. And the, the Eels start panicking and start getting out of their systems and what worked for them in the first half. They start trying to do other things that they wouldn't normally do. And then they come home and try and make this game really interesting. Got down to, you know, obviously got down to the goal kick and not wanting to kick it and kicking it back to them and trying to win the game off a kickoff with seconds to go. And I guess the coach at the press conference, you know, said it all. Two minutes, 13 into the press conference, I'm done talking. Like, I'm sorry, guys, but I've got to go. Like, he was disappointed because I feel like we've spoken about this on here a lot. But you don't know what you're going to get with the Dragons. They've been so inconsistent with their performances. We spoke spoke about it last week saying that the, the eight spot is in their hand. Uh, they It's up to them now if they want to stand there or not. And when you put in a performance like that, you, like, what do you say as a coach? Like, I don't know. Like, even at half time, it would have been so hard to say, hey, guys, we can still come back from this. And then you wait for 12 minutes and then you start playing the football that kind of was what they try and play to, you know, get their edges involved, Sua involved, you know what I mean? Their wingers involved, Lomax getting involved, Ben Hunt starting to play some footy. That's what they normally do. But they just got out enthused early just from people that had more intent and what they were trying to do. Dylan Brown was enormous for them. He was um, running around everything, putting guys into holes, and I thought they were just, they were the better team until the last 12 minutes, pretty much. Yeah, Dylan Brown was the best on the ground. Um, 
Scuff Sam him. one too. Just a wee bit. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little bit. <laughs> there are some up fungi, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, I thought he was great. Um, Gutherson, in his supporting role, bagged a couple of tries. Mm. Awesome seeing uh, Michael Sivo in full flight, just full power again. Good we, haven't, luck. we haven't seen him enough this year do that, but it's great to see him a couple of times this weekend. But yeah, Parramatta, they they rolled through some flimsy defence for the first seventy minutes or so. You know, the, the Sean Lane break and try, just going through a flimsy tackle through Ben Hunt, which you don't see. You don't no. normally see that. And as you're saying, the disappointing thing is they were in the driving seat. They were in the box seat to hold that eighth spot, the Dragons coming into this round. All they had to do was win, win that game. And they didn't show enough desperation in, until that last 10, 12 minutes you know, when they started to pull things out of the bag. Some of that was, as Blairy alluded to, power coming out of their defensive systems. And one of their tries when they made the break down the left-hand side I don't know what Cartwright's doing when he shoots out of the line and leaves the right edge wanting. But they were all over the shop from then on. Mm-hmm. They just they were just lucky, the Eels, that they had time on their side. And I think they scored the last try with two seconds to go. So they ran out of time more or less. If there's another minute, they could possibly have scored another yeah. try and stolen the win, the Dragons. But that's what Flanagan will be frustrated about. You play 10 minutes rather than playing for the whole 80 and that'll be frustrating for Trent Barrett too, for power. The last four weeks, they've had really strong mm. moments in games. Yeah. Next week, in that wooden spoon final, they're going to have to put it on for 80 minutes. That's going to be all on. And they're going to have to put that 80-minute performance in because the Tigers will be. The match of the round, you reckon? That's going to be a <laughs> Oh, I it's going to be about a hundred points to. 99. It'll be, I'll be huge. <laughs> uh, you know, it'll be similar to the scoreline that that was well, this in this game. You know, what I mean, like both teams can score points, obviously, but you know, the Tigers. I think the Tigers are in the box. They're coming off a rest, like they can take this as their grand final and just go, "Hey, boys, like, man, just put your body on the line for eighty minutes. Just do whatever it takes." to get us off the spoon, eh? <laughs> Far out. It's going to be a game. I feel like the Tigers need it more as well. Is it the, I, did you say it was a Friday night game? I think it's Friday night or Saturday The, the last? Which one? Let me just look. Sort it out, bro. Sorry. 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 <laughs> Not the, is it the Friday night or the Saturday night game? I've got be, a feeling it's Friday. Is there two games on Friday? I think it's the first on the Friday. Hey, let's get it on. Right, sorry, watch that one. Bridge, uh, internet. Oh, you're still fans. using that excuse. <laughs> Anyways, it'll be, a, it'll be an awesome game, um, the spoon final. <laughs> both teams going at it mate the media will pump it up this week over there you like, got it. it'll, be, it'll be huge for both teams first game Friday night how good like people are tuning in straight after work getting to the pubs watch this game because it's going to be a cracker Fuwa, yeah, <laughs> and then the Roosters is the Rabbitohs second game Friday uh, in this in this uh, game the 44-40 massive game Mike Acevo obviously as you said awesome to see him in full flight with the hat trick he's been the most prolific try scorer this season despite only playing 11 games he scored 15 tries his return's been the best yeah by a uh, by quite a bit obviously Loffy also has a good return he's played 20 games has 23 tries and Dominic Young 18 games 19 tries but apart from that there's no one else that has more tries in games, and Mike Acevo has four more tries in games. Uh, obviously, his suspensions and a couple injuries is what's kept him out. He probably, do you reckon having him in for more of the season would have saved them or no? Oh, his form at the start of the year was terrible. I just don't think he was up to standard anyway at the start of the season. Hence why he was in and out of first grade. Then some suspensions, and then like like Willie said, if he can deliver what he's seen, what we've seen on the weekend more consistently, which we know he can because he's proven it before. Alongside a lot of those other players, I think, for the Paramount Eels haven't played their best football. But when he's come back, he's actually tucked the ball on, the, on his wing and understands that he's a strong player. Like his, He's a big boy, hard to tackle. So he played his best game, I thought, for a long time. So, you know, Ravalawa, like sometimes Ravalawa, like sometimes he plays some good stuff, sometimes he does some poor things. And I've just seen some stuff from wingers these days, and I'm thinking, like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, what are you doing, you know? Like, it's not a hard job as a winger. <laughs> it's not a hard job as a winger. So for all those wingers out there, oh. catch the ball, run hard. 
catch the ball, run hard, and when we when the backs make a play or when the forwards do all the work for the middle, you score the try. Like, wow, <laughs> sometimes I just made it. Baffles me you know, some of these wingers, will he? Yeah, I'd, I think uh, he would have added to them, no doubt, had he played some more. I just think Mitchell Moses was the biggest loss for them this year. Mitchell Moses is the one they've missed. He showed that in origin, his quality, and when he came back, he turned their fortunes around in, in the couple of games he played just before being selected for origin. Had he played throughout the course of the season, they would have been a better team, I think. For the Dragons, Connor Molizen uh, was called in late to replace Jacob Little because Jacob Little knew it was up. Saturday, the day before Father's Day, his wife was in labour. Of course, you're not going to miss that when it's about to be Father's Day. So good on the man for making the right decision. Obviously, they lost the game, so maybe it was, you know, maybe he was debating in his mind. Should he have played? No, no, no. Father's Day. Father's Day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but Malizen uh, was very good uh, as a replacement. One try, 63 tackles, two misses. Uh, pretty good for just a f- like Marshke not there, Farmanu Brown injured as well, That their usual backup hookers. So this guy's like the third yeah. string hooker. And great effort. Good effort, eh? Yeah, great effort. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, it's all good. Uh, let's go to... <laughs> The best game of the round. The Dolphins versus the Broncos. What's that? What's that? That's the Hammers thing, man. What is it, though? His totem, right? Oh, bro, I'm a true Dolphins supporter. What can I say? Uh, they absolutely annihilated the Broncos. Yeah, screw the Broncos, man. Hate them. They're the big brothers of Brisbane, not like my my boys, the Dolphins. But, yeah, 40-6. to six, Herbie Farnworth. The best player, second, for me, second best centre in the NRL behind Stephen Crichton. Oh, it was just a beautiful game. If you had them both in your team, holy, you'd have <laughs> some mean, two mean centres, eh? Um, what a pickup that was for the Dolphins. I was hard to see. I, I can't believe the, I guess, the Broncos let them go. I guess they saw um, Differences on where who could play in those positions. Cobo, I think they said he was going to be a centre, and Cobo's been all around the place now this year. And man, he's been a huge pickup. The difference from him coming back from injury and how he's been able to help the Dolphins get to where they are, it's been crazy. Hammer has always been enormous for for the Dolphins. He's never letting one down. Trey Fuller, holy, the bro can play footy. Eh? He's tough, man, and he's just a committed dude. I love watching small guys that just put their body on the line. Like, you're coming up against guys twice your size, but he doesn't care about his body. He has no respect. He just chucks himself in there. And this was a dominant performance. Uh, again, we speak about attitude and, and the guys turning up the want. There's always a rivalry now. Wayne Bennett, obviously, with Kevy Walters and the Broncos. Um, you know, the players being, like you said, the big brothers, the Broncos, them being this franchise club uh, that has ever been around and they don't not play finals football because of who they are, the players that they can get to that club because of the Broncos' name itself and how many young, great talent players that they have coming through their pathways and we've seen that on display. But on on this night, it didn't matter what talent you had on the field. It was more about the wants and, and wanting to win. And the Dolphins came up. You heard the fans booing the Broncos when they went out. It was a Dolphins home game. But it's great to see. That that adds to the um, the theatre and the rivalry of what these two clubs have had. Um, but they were just enormous. I thought Sean O'Sullivan um, was great in the halves. Plays nice and square. He's not your fastest half, but he's a footballer. He's smart. He's got a good little kicking game on him. Understands the game. We've seen him win games against the Warriors on the droppy. So knows knows what about a pressure football. But these guys, you know, Herbie was enormous. Playing against his old clubs, a lot of his mates. I'm sure he still lives with a couple of those boys too. So, um, mate, the contest was huge in the consideration of where, and the scheme of the the competition, the Broncos. Um, wanting to play finals football and Kevy speaking about the importance of, you know, they're going to be playing finals football, but it doesn't look like it now. There's still a chance, though. There's still a chance. So Kevy might still get it right, not on the back of that effort and, and, and the way that they played on that night because, geez, they're coming up against a hot uh, storm team, 11 players back, and, man, they're losing. They've lost a lot of inju- had a lot of injuries, and, you know, Payne Huss looked sore. He didn't look like he was playing his best footy, but... You know, give credit to the Dolphins. I said they're my smoky for the eight, but I reckon they might get there. 
Yeah, I'll speak of the players in a moment. I thought the the biggest storyline was Wayne Bennett and how he prepared his team and the mind games that he that he played throughout the week with the media and how he fooled not only the supporters mm. and the fans, the media, but also the Broncos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he built it up about no Nicarima and no Bromwich. Um, took the team away, played it down, how, you know, they were the underdogs and whilst it was their home game, they were missing so many people and forced the Broncos into a false sense of confidence and mm. Um, training on Monday, apparently they trained in all different positions, and then yeah, just for Wednesday the media, was eh? for the media and fooling them, and training behind closed doors on the Wednesday, and the players just focused and honed in to put that performance in because they were outstanding. They all put it out. They were talking about Farnworth. We're talking about Trey Trey Fuller, Hammer has try again. What a picture to see him go 80, 90 yeah, meters and him, just mate. cruise, just cruise. Um, I think Tavita Pangai, since he's yeah, come back, has been has. enormous for them. You know, they've been short on stocks and even missing Jesse Bromwich, he stepped yeah. up. At the moment, he's their best front rower. You know, he's been outstanding for them when nobody else would touch him. Mm. And such as what Wayne Bennett is doing for that side. And for a team that, when we, while we're speaking about it, would have understood that St. George lost. Yeah, okay, the door's open a little bit. Mm. They didn't go close to walking through the door. Right from the start, it was all Dolphins all day. And and congratulations to them. If they if they go through, they've got Newcastle this week, and I think it'll be one of those teams yeah. that gets through to the eight. It's, yeah. it's tough. All those other teams need to rely on them getting a draw after a golden point time and then come out and then get a win to jump them, which will be nigh on impossible. <laughs> but... So it'll, it'll be. I think it'll be the Dolphins mm. if they do get there. You know, in two years, and as a parting gift from Wayne Bennett, that would be an outstanding achievement for them, especially for what they've been through the last month or so, where they've not looked like getting there. To turn it on at the right time just says everything about the master coach. Yeah, the good thing about Wayne, and you mentioned all these little tactics that he plays, like he gets the media. You know what I mean? He gets the understanding of players. He knows what people would be thinking. So he plays these games with the media on his own. He doesn't involve <laughs> any other players in these conversations. He, he deflects everything towards him, yep. himself. He puts all the pressure on himself because he knows that at the end of the day, these footballers don't need to be listening to the things that I'm doing. It's just, you just go and do your job. We'll hide behind closed doors. We know what we want to do. You just leave me deal with the media and changing people around, knowing what positions they're going to play in. You know, playing these games with not only... Uh, the media, but the Broncos, to, to go in the undercover and just go, we're going to ambush these guys. Like he would have spoken about it at Captain's Run, spoken about on game day in the dressing rooms at here. No one knows what we're going to do, but we're going to go out there and ambush the Broncos because they think they're better than us and they think they're already going to play finals football, but we're here to play finals <coughs> football. And it showed from the get-go, bro. Like that's, that's a Wayne Bennett pre-game speech right there. You know what I mean? It's like backs against the wall, I'm going to lead this by being who I am. And you know, imagine sitting in a room right before a game and Wayne Bennett stands up in front of you and just tilts this mean ass speech on. And you'll just, you must be get up, just start char hooing and trying to tackle, <laughs> tackle your own teammates in the dressing rooms, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Because I feel like I can kind of feel that sense of what it would have been like just before kickoff in that, in that Suncorp dressing room that he would have stood in front of those boys so tall and so passionate about what he was about to say that the boys would have got so much belief in it and felt how he felt. And you would have got up off your seat, started like mostly punching walls because yep. that's how you that's how you would have felt. Like you would do anything right now to to, to show how much he means to you and how much the team means to you to, to the, the team to get this result. And man, I could imagine. That speech before that speech at the pregame, just going, "Yo, we're on here, boys. Doesn't matter who's going to be in front of us. We're going to go and smoke them." And that's what they delivered. Like you said, Willie, uh, Dolphins versus Knights is basically the deciding game of who mm. will be the one in the eight. The Raiders uh, in tenth, and the Dragons in eleventh uh, could technically get in there, but obviously yeah. very unlikely. And the Broncos are fully out, which means that for the third consecutive season, previous year's grand final runner-up 
have missed the playoffs the next year. And obviously, you look at where the three of those teams are right now. Mm. Broncos, Eels, uh, Rabbitohs. They're all out of the playoffs right now. Is there some kind of curse or like, how how is that happening? You make it all the way to the grand final. Especially for the Broncos, they were winning with 20 minutes to go. How then the next season does this kind of thing happen? Uh, it's a mixture of everything, bro. Um, I guess in comfortableness, you know, feeling comfortable that it's just going to come again. Um, uh, a lesser preseason, um, you know, uh, I'm not saying there's a lesser want in wanting to get back there, but subconsciously we've done enough to get back there because this is we've already done it before. Um, a lack of miserably uh, respect for the grind of the game and, and a lack of respect for the teams that weren't in the eight last year wanting to get into those same positions or the team that want to get into the four like the Sharks, like like uh, the Dragons that were in there, like some of these other teams that are sitting in the top positions, like the Prentice Panthers. When you, when you have a team that consistently competes at the top level, there's obviously a really good culture and a real good want to understanding what it takes to get there, but understanding that it also, what you did the previous year isn't going to get you back there. You've got to do that plus more. Um, so I think there's a bit of a mixture of everything where maybe some of the things you let slide through the year that's now creeping back on us. Obviously, injuries don't help. I have not having your best 17 or your 25 available ready to go. That's But every club goes through those things. But that's what cause that's what well, that's why having a good culture and a good system, you know, like the storm, like the Penrith Panthers does. When you have players that come in, they get a job done. They just haven't been able to do that. Whether it's just them just being comfortable and thinking we're going to be able to get back there just enough, I don't know. But it's disappointing because they're a club, like he says, they don't miss finals football. Like they play every single year because of who they are, because of the club and what it means to them. So it's it's hard to see them. Um, sitting out of the eight and not playing finals, especially when they come second and we're 20 minutes away from winning their grand final. Yeah, I think there's a couple of things. You've got to respect the process and how you achieved that success last year. Mm -hmm. you know, the intricate things that you put in place as far as the processes you went through to prepare yourself for that grind. Nobody expected you to get there last year, so... You crossed every T and dotted every I to make sure that you got there. You forget some of that sometimes when you back up. Losing Flegler and Farnworth were big losses mm. for them from the team that did so well last year. Um, losing Reynolds for so long mm. um, this season, that's also hurt them. And what it also does for me, it highlights how even more – important it is and great that Penrith were able to bounce back from losing their grand final and then bounce back to win three. You're talking about the last three grand final runner-ups not even making the playoffs for them to to lose and then come back and win it three times. What an achievement that is. You know, the Broncos, they've got some reflecting to do. They've got some reflecting to do internally about how they get back to some of that stuff and, and earn the right to get back in the playoffs again. They're still a young side. They're going to be good for a little while, but they've got to learn those lessons and learn it fast. And then for the Dolphins Knights clash, obviously I think you said the Dolphins are your pick before. Man, Trey Fuller, Herbie, uh, Hammer versus Ponga, Best and Gagai. What an absolute battle that's going to be. Who are you picking in that game for next weekend, Adam? Man, those Knights, those Knights three you spoke about, there's so much experience in there, eh? Uh, Ponga, I know we're going to talk about that game, but geez, he was a he was good. Care guys coming into his own, and we've spoken about him here the last few weeks. How good he's been, best like at his best, he is strong. I'm going for the young fellas. I'm going for the young dolphins. I think the momentum, the Wayne Bennett factor. I think they get it done, and I think they get into the eight. So um, yeah, that's Fins where they up, go. Baby, let's go. The dolphins. We're going to the eight, man. We're that's just my opinion, finals. bro. That's just my opinion, bro. <laughs> it's only my opinion, bro. Don't be holding me. <laughs> uh, next game: Sharks versus Warriors at points bet thirty twenty eight to the Warriors. The fairy tale ending, as everyone keeps saying. Sean Johnson writes his own history, stuff like that. Uh, but it was a pretty awesome way to end it, hey? Awesome way to finish. Um, I know Dills. One of our guys in here didn't get to the end of the um, game. 
Um, so he didn't know what happened until he saw the social media feed that the Warriors won. So really disappointed that he didn't get to the end of this game. Um, I sat and I was on Sky and, um, you know, I was watching the game and I'm thinking, geez, 22-4 at half time. I don't see how the Warriors get back into this game and I don't see how they win it. Um, but when you think about it, you know, and I guess the conversation you hear Sean talk about it after the game is that they were in a similar situation last time they played at Shark Park, whatever it's called. What is it, Points Bet or Points Bet, Points Bet now? Um, they were in the same situation and it had to be that one moment. And the moment, and I think the defining moment was, you know, there was a few high tackles, a few penalties, a few niggles going, and then they send Gail Edel to the bin. And I think on the back of that, I think there was maybe 12 minutes to go or just over 12 minutes. Oh. Sean starts to step up. Sean starts to start playing some footy. Sean starts to putting people in position. Sean looks for Luke Metcalf. Everyone finds another gear. And the shape that they played is the shape that we like to see when the Warriors play. And we know the shape they can, they can play. Put pressure on, on the Sharks and made them make decisions that they didn't want to because they had some good strong runners in there. So at the end of the day, what a fairy tale. I heard the the commentators as well watching the game. They wanted something to happen for Sean Johnson. They wanted Sean Johnson to take a two-point drop goal. They went away from it. Uh, you know, Sean, uh, Metcalf had a crack at it, missed it. The game was over, was it? Sean gets his hands on it at the end, and he, he speaks about it after the game, about having played three consecutive games. I think that's the most he's played this year, To like, you know, for himself. The confidence that he had in himself because of the consecutive time on the field, the understanding of the flow of the game, and then able to set things up in a way that he could see things. And that's what he spoke about. And I think that last play, he said he spoke to Dylan Walker about what we needed to do and how he wanted to get there and the look that he wanted to see. And, he, and they said, like he said, that he got the look that they wanted, uh, whether it was the right one. It was in the end because he gets around that. He sits on the left and then goes back to the right. And the shape was there. And I'm guessing at the, at the long, a lot of the times when they ran their shape, either running those double leads or they're running just a normal simple block play. So the defense is sitting there waiting for him to run those plays. He just goes, boom, straight across the face of all those block runners, straight to Dallin. And Dallin still had some work to do to score that try. What I liked about Dallin is, Dallin, as that ball was moving, he just cuts on the ball. So the winger... Was it Smith, Stone Smith? Stone Street. Stone Street. Stone Street. <laughs> he, he's standing there thinking the ball, he's just going to catch it straight. At the same time, as the ball's moving in, Dallin just goes, bam, on his inside shoulder, slips over, scores that try. And I'm just like, man, what a way to finish the game for Sean. And the Warriors, they'll be happy with the way they finished um, because it's a long time before you play some more games. And if you would have gone out on the loss, it would have been tough, a tough year. But it kind of wipes away the last... Most of the year to finish on this nice little win for them. And the Sharks, they'll be disappointed. Um, they're, they're a tough team. They're obviously a top four team. And um, Nico was good. They were playing well. And then I just thought, you know, once they got it, their discipline let them down, once their discipline come into their game, that's when, the Sean, uh, that's when the Warriors started playing some footy. So a lot of things to work on. I think the main thing for the Sharks will be just discipline and being nice and disciplined for next, next week when they come into these big games. I'll come to the discipline part of it in a second. But, um, yeah, Sharks had all the running <laughs> in that game. And I, I didn't see a way through, not just because of the scoreline, but they had a couple of tries disallowed. Um, they had so much momentum go their way. Um, but full credit to the Warriors in the second half and full credit to the group to be able to send Sean Adam, and Jazz out on the right way. Mm. You know, we... A lot of talk about Sean, and rightly so, but there were some other blokes who left as well and who've been great servants to the club and to the game here in New Zealand, Jazz in particular, you know, from Christchurch, came up, spent nine or so years at the club, you know, came through the system. Um, he's he's still on the lookout, by all accounts, for a new job, and hopefully he finds some somewhere to go to. He deserves to carry on his career because I've liked him the last two weeks when he's got a starting spot. Mm. He's been he's been good from the off. It's been awesome. But yeah, it was great for the Warriors to uh, to finish that way and for Sean to come up with the magic play and find that double cutout pass to Dallin to finish it off and get the result and get the win and see them happy and celebrating mm. and, and for the fans to really enjoy it because that, that's a strong Cronulla side. That's a, yeah. a side that's really found its mojo again and I've mentioned that before but back to the discipline stuff, Frustrated me. I'm, I'm really frustrated with some of these rulings and how they're going. 
because there's a couple. I, there was one in the Dolphins game. Um, I don't know what they expected Kalfusi to do. When mm. Adam Reynolds gets tackled, there's just <laughs> merely contact. Yeah, it was on the head, but he was sliding. And so is Dallin when Kale Eagle. Yeah. He's sliding. If if Kale's arm isn't there that makes contact, then it's his knee. So what's what's more dangerous? Mm. You know, the other thing for me is and it goes back to last week with with Crichton. Some of those were simbining and some of them weren't this week. Either we go with all contacts mm. in the head, you go for 10 minutes or not. I I can't take this mild contact. Mm. You know, I don't see mild contact in our game. I said this last week. So that's that's the frustrating thing, thing for me. There were two or three or maybe more throughout the weekend. Um, Ruben Cotter had one. Yeah. You know, where they're sliding and you make contact with the head. He's, he's low. We've got mm. players coming straight out. Um, Xavier Willison had one. Yep. He's oh, massive. Yeah. He's massive. How low do you want him to get? You know, he's just trying to stay upright. The ball carrier is going low. It's not yep. him. Uh, sometimes we've got to really have a look at this rule and how we're, we're doing it because I understand the frustration of, I think it was Trent Robinson, but also Craig Fitzgibbon, yep. that we're really clamping down at the wrong time of the year. We, we can't be having the competition and the playoff games affected or the outcome being judged because of this. Well, that's why, um, you know, seeing that Warriors game, the boys started pushing and shoving. It gives the, the bunker a chance to look at these things, you know what I mean? And sometimes they're just clips and sometimes a lot of it is slipping over. And, and when they talk about, you know, last week they talk about mitigating factors – Slipping's a mitigating factor to the hitting someone high. Yes, you, if he slips over and you hit him high, that should be just a penalty. Let the judiciary sort that out later. You know, not a not a sin. But I think for the um the sharks one, I think there was like three, three taps to the head, and then Hazelton had one, and then Kale's um Dallin one, and then I think they said, oh well, there's already been three already. You're this is the fourth one. You've got to go. You know what I mean? So like this is that's that's where the, the confusion comes again. You know, I mean we're always talking about it on here about, you know, this protection of Haas or these contact to the head. You know, we spoke about Crichton getting time on the sidelines, and then there was other incidents on the weekend where there wasn't it was binned. So every weekend, and like Craig Fitzgibbon said, it's like it's the wrong time to be having crackdowns because you want seven, 13 on the field. Needed. You want 13 on the field. And as we get to the finals, it's more important that these guys stay on the field. So you wouldn't want to lose a player for, for the interpretation that he slipped and he hits him high, and then we say, oh, well, you've got 10 minutes. It changes the game. changes the whole momentum of the game now. You lose one player, teams are too good to be able to defend with less players on the oh, like they're too good attacking less players on the field. They just they just get it. You know what I mean? Warriors, obviously, you know, Sean doing this thing and then being able to score tries. Well, Kale was on the on on the on in the bench because of his incident. So it's just hard, hard when it's confusing all the time and there's some rules on one night and there's different ones on the other or different interpretations that one ref sees something like this and the other sees it differently. It's it's tough. And I would It'd be so confusing for coaches. What do you think about if it's, a, well, a simbin would be hard, but if it's a send-off that you can still put 13 on the field but you lose them off the bench? Yeah, yeah. So you're down to three subs. Yep. But we still get 13 on 13. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I think I think that's a great idea. So you lose someone, you put another one off the bench, that's your bench. We still get the quality of yeah. product. Because we want that, we want, especially finals time, you want your best players on the field. If you make a decision to to tackle someone high um, and you get your technique wrong and you come in with an intent and it's all wrong, then and you get red card and you get off, well, we should be able to, to keep the game flowing and to keep the game, uh, you know, being still the product that we want, we've got to find ways to try and keep 13 on the field. But again, I find it hard because then, you know, it's – then you're th- you're messing around with interchanges and then people, you're going to have to think a little bit more. It's it's coaches having to think out of the box well, now. It hurts. It can hurt Yeah, them. it can and hurt that's a what team. Happens. So if you give them the ultimatum, then maybe they start thinking about things differently and mm-hmm. players start thinking about things differently as well because – yeah, it's a tough position to be in when you're defending with less players. And, you know, you've seen this one of the last games that's played. 
the Canberra Raiders had to work their butts off for well, most of that game. Yeah. You could do it uh, just – it's 10 minutes off with 12, same as the Sinbin, and then have them replace for a send-off just to – so then the Sinbin isn't completely ruled out of – uh, meaning anything. Something I've seen online, which I want to throw to you I like that conversation. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up, man. Uh, is for the Sharks, a lot of people seem to think that they are the biggest pretenders in the NRL. They think they the chatter that I was reading was basically every time when it gets to the end of the season, this happened last season, they play important games, they play winnable games, <clears throat> and they just choke. Uh, which kind of happened in this game. I mean, obviously, they had the lead and then the Warriors came back. What do you guys think of that term, pretenders, and does it apply to the Sharks? Well, they, they say that they can't beat a top four team. Eh? They haven't been able to prove they can beat a top four team. Uh, you, but you come this next competition, which is in a week's time, everything is everyone's on equal points, on zero. So you just have to turn up for that one game. And you take one game at a time. The old cliche that they say it's one day at a time, one game at a time. And I, I think they've got a good enough team. They've got a good enough team to compete with the better teams. Hence why they sit in the top four. Um, they are a strong team. I thought Nico was good in that game for his first game back in a long time. Um, you know, some of those, the, the one of the tries set up for Hazleton, which I just, the Warriors just watch him run. And he literally ran all the way to the five meter line and put Hazleton straight over the top, straight into a hole. And I'm thinking, hold on. If you're letting Nico play some footy, which he can, and it was that's what I was like, man, there's no way the Warriors are going to come back in a second half because I watched that run, I think it was right before half time, and he just puts, he walks over the line, and I'm thinking, geez, they're in for a hard one. So I think they've got quality players through their team, um, and they've got good enough players in there to compete with those better teams. It's just about the attitude of turning up in these big moments. And once this competition starts, this new one, like it's all on. Like I think everyone changes their mindset. Yeah, they've got uh, Mulatalo and Sifu, um Talakai to come back to add to their stocks. They've got that monkey on their back. They haven't won a playoff game for a long time. That's the demon they've got to get over. If they can get over that on week one, um, they get a second life anyway, so they get two bites at it. They could be a different side. They'll understand that. They'll be they'll be riding about that all week into the playoffs mm. and. You know, they can't win a playoff game, and especially under Craig Fitzgibbon, they're one and done. Um, that'll be a big driving force for them. And to turn that around, um, I think they could be a threat and throw that in some people's faces. On to the, the next game, uh, the last day of games. Knights versus Titans at McDonald Jones, 36-14 to 14 to the Knights. And as you alluded to before, Ponga, two tries. The outside backs just doing their thing for the Knights. It's a bit later than last season's run that they yeah. went on. But, hey, they're in that two-man, yeah. two-horse race to get the eighth seed. Or if they win next week, then they're in the finals again, just like last season. Yeah, he's, the last few weeks, he's coming to his own, I think. Kalen Ponga, you can see him manipulating the defence with his attack and his squaring people up, putting people into holes. He's a hard man to defend anyway, just because he's so fast and so tough as a as a smaller fullback. He can beat you left both feet. He can beat you on the outside of speed and he can also beat you off a pass. Um, so he's always a threat. As long and what the problem is for the what was the problem for the Knights was their halves combination. That's where they've struggled this year. But I feel like what they've managed to be able to do is to free up Kalen. And when Kalen's playing well, it's because the forwards are either going forward or the halves are giving him the space to be able to play football. So I think that's been the big change in, in, in the Newcastle Knights is the halves and being able to free up. And we always said is, is if they could give some space to Kalen Ponga to play some football, he can play footy. He can score tries. He can do what he does on the weekend. So yeah, he was he was great alongside the guys I've already mentioned. And obviously, we talk about Dan Gagai and how he's been influential the last few weeks and his performances and his form has been enormous. Um, he's a big part of the edge. Obviously, best being back in that team. He's been strong. He's strong. He's going to be there. That, that's their, their point of difference coming into these this back end of this last game is if you can get the ball to those guys nine times out of ten, um, they're going to be stronger for it. And, you know, their middles are going forward. I've seen Leo Thompson's good try um, over the top of the young fullback and on debut, Paul Fuller. Mate, <laughs> like, where do you tackle him, eh? Like, I, I, if that was me, I'm sure he'd tackle his head, get a penalty. 
<laughs> like close your eyes, hope for the best. You're going to get bumped off anyway. But you can see how much it meant, not only to uh, not only to Leo, but you know, just I think it's been a build up of their year. You know what I mean? It's just there's been some outside noise. Peter Sullivan's there, he's cleaning out a few people in there. He's he's putting people on notice, and you can see the inf- like that the how much it meant to not only Leo but the the Knights on this day. And unfortunately, uh, the Titans, you know. Jojo starts off really well, and then they just can't get it done. I think the class of class of Kalen Ponga was the difference in the end. Yeah, and it was the class of Ponga. And what happens because of all those threats that Blair is talking about, wherever he parks himself, they've got to account for that. So when they get a quick play of the ball and they flood through the middle. He's just sniffing. He's sniffing on any opportunity or any half break, and that's how he scored his couple of tries. But if and when it starts to tighten up, he just drifts himself to the edges mm. where there's some spaces. They play to him. He either runs through him or he's just got that quality of pass to put the people like Bess and Gagai away or Sharp, Sharp. Mm. who's been good on the on the wing. He's he plays games, and when he's on, as he is at the moment, and as he was. At this time last season, he's just picking holes and he's playing with the defences and he knows that, you know, he can manipulate them to a point that, all right, you're doing this, I'll do this and I'll expose your deficiencies and your weaknesses somewhere else. And then when I've made enough breaks out there and you start to overcompensate, I'm coming back through the middle again. I'm going to I'm gonna shoot you wherever you allow me to. So that's the quality of Kalen and what he's doing at the moment. It's, it's very – there – the way he's playing now is how he was last year and time mm. in the run there. They're as good as he is mm. and he's allowing them to be. And if they get through, um, it'd be the turnaround of the season, I reckon, from where they've been. Yeah. Uh, some moments there that talking about the coach and whether he should go, even though he signed a new big contract and um, Kalen wasn't the same player, but he's, he's definitely shown that he's still got it within him and that try that, the try that young the group scored, you know, was a great try on his on his debut, but then just couldn't quite stop it at the other end. <laughs> you know, poor young fella put in, learning how tough it is in first grade football. But yeah, whether they missed Keanu Kinney or not, and his energy and danger carrying the ball, still to be seen. But yeah, that the Gold Coast um have exceeded expectations by a little bit. But in the main, I think they're where Everybody thought they would be. It's, been, it's still been a good season under mm. Des Haslam. There's still some great potential for them to exceed their finishing spot next year. Because obviously they pulled it back. I think how many games in a row did they lose to start the season? Seven or eight or something. Yeah. Like they were a massive loser. They won their first one here. Yeah. Where? Against the Warriors. I think it's the Warriors. Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, that, man, I remember that game. Holy, that was a. Paid them into form for a couple of weeks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was going to say, yeah, about Kenny. I feel like they were missing him uh, deathly much on a attack for sure. Like the way that he is able to, when he's swinging around mm. to the outside, linking up with Khan Pereira or um, Jojo Fafita. It's just the speed, bro, of yeah. some of these fullbacks now. You know, that's that's the threat more than anything is how fast they can get to the outside shoulder of a defender which then puts pressure on the defender outside that person, you know, and then the, it creates opportunities for the others on an attack. So these these fullbacks that, although, you know, he can beat you with your speed, he can also beat you with his footwork through and it's been tough through the middle of the park and ducking under tackles and stuff like that. So that's been the difference for, um, you know, as in these new fullbacks coming through, you know, Tain to Opik is quite similar to him as well. Um, Gray, all these smaller guys, the the young fullback that jumped in at the West Tigers, like they're all quite similar heights. And um, as they get better through the competition and more consistency on the field, uh, consistency on field and time, uh, these guys are going to be the next generation of fullbacks. It's young Sua, yeah, young Sua. They're not going to be these big Greg English type fullbacks. You know what I mean? All your Chaboyovich is going to be these small guys. There is still space for those guys, but these little guys, at the game's coming and playing into their hands right now. Yeah, so well, the the Titans, I think uh, their whole team has a bit of that. Obviously, they're more of a future project this season. Well, they still got Tenor. Tenor's sitting on the side, you know? Yeah, exactly. Tenor's sitting on the side. Oh, I've seen some stuff of him running 
uh, last week. So that's exciting. Oh, yeah, that's exciting. Come back from his ACL. So, mm. um, you know, he'll get a big pre-season. He'll add some starts to that middle of the yeah. forward and just some leadership quality. He's their captain, you know what I mean? And, gee, he's a great player too. He'll actually help Queensland. Um, so, yeah, I think having him back will help. Why are you bringing that up, man? It's still ages away. Hey, planning. Let us Blues enjoy the victory for now. <laughs> right. Planning. <laughs> Move on. Last game of the weekend, uh, Roosters versus Raiders at Allianz. 14-12 to the Raiders. What a gutsy defensive performance from them. How they managed to do it, we will never know. This is the Roosters that have been putting up 60 on teams that are the same level as the Raiders, but somehow they did it. And Luke Carey obviously missed that kick to send it to Golden Point, which would have been epic. Uh, but, yeah, well done to the Raiders. Yeah, definitely a, a huge shift in attitude for the Raiders. Um, but knowing coming up against a quality side, they can, like you said, put on 40-plus points on most teams on any day. You know what I mean? And um, they had Elliot Whitehead off for 20 minutes of that game, a couple of silly incidents. Um, but... They worked their butts off to get that win, and I was um, I was quietly cheering them on because I thought, man, for a team that's been under a bit of pressure this year, a team that Ricky Stewart said he's developing these next generations of kids, a team that he thinks that he doesn't have too much patience when it comes to playing these players, but he's had to learn that as an older coach. Um, you can see where they're going, and if you can instill that belief and defence and the want and the will to keep turning up, like that will put you in good stead. He, he speaks about not being able to recruit marquee players, so having to grow from the ground up, which is I think has always been the Canberra Raiders' way, um, but they've got some great kids in there that can be the future of and be those marquee players for the Raiders. Up against a, a quality side, and on paper, and I always say it, is a grand final team, is a team that could win the competition. Um, there's moments in their game that the, the, the Roosters will like to have back, obviously a couple of injuries, um, key injuries too for mind, I think. Yeah. Uh, you know, Walker, Sam Walker's been elite this year. I think everything he's touched, everything he's done has been the difference at times for the Roosters this year. His kicking game second to none, his goal kicking is even better. Um, but his way he plays, the way that he can read games for a young kid, he's been enormous. But I just hope, and I think he may have done his ACL, which will be disappointing for him. Um, he's just come back from one. Um, and then obviously Brandon Smith, um, losing someone like him around the middle of the park as well, adds a little bit of starch. He may have done his ACL as well. So their their final hopes, let's not just write them off, but those two players are key to, to what they do. Um so it's disappointing for, for the Roosters and where they are. And obviously Trent Robinson isn't happy with it all. But uh, the most disappointing one for me is Mashbury Jordan Alpana. Um, doesn't get the send-off. Uh, and, and we always talk about fairy tale endies, uh, endings. He only found out, they only found out this week that he was, um, he was leaving. So last week they had a big um, celebration for Elliot Whitehead at, at, at the stadium. Mm -hmm. uh, last home game, uh, Jordan goes off with a cheekbone. Broken nose. He looks uglier than what he was already. <laughs> poor fella. Yeah. You see that bro, bro's face, the poor dude. Um, must be the fun that they coming out of those fellas. <laughs> Anyways, uh, you know, so, so poor old Jordan Rappener doesn't get the send off uh, that he that he deserves. He's been a, a cornerstone of that club uh, and he's been the heart and soul of what he does on the field. So another great win for a great win for the Raiders uh, up against a quality side and Hey, you'll take that one any day of the week. Yeah, all well, the headlines about this game are about the injuries, aren't they? Radley and Brandon Smith. Uh, but I agree, Sam Walker's the biggest one out of the three. Is uh, not taking anything away from the other two. I just think how much he, as a halfback, touches the ball and has an influence on the game, I think he's their biggest loss. I also think that he's more than likely their player of the year this year in, in what has been mm. the most potent attacking side um, for the last couple of seasons, not just this year. But I also said before during the year that <clears throat> if you're able to come up defensively against them, that you could go close to getting them. And that's exactly what they did. And it was all effort. It was all heart. There were a couple of moments there and the commentators were saying that the, the Roosters had six on three overlaps and the effort from the Raiders just to go shut it down, it wasn't all perfect systematically. Nah. 
It wasn't all perfect pattern-wise, but it was all perfect heart-wise. They were just willing to get across there, get numbers to the threat, shut it down, boom, go again. Even with Elliot Whitehead having a, a brain explosion, trying to kick the ball out of Crichton's arms. I'm no. not sure what he was trying to trying to do there, watching they, a bit so of Karate they, Kid or something. They send them off for that. They send them off for that. Yeah, but yeah. that was his second binning. Yeah. yeah. But what they, what they say was dangerous. Foolish more than anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I wouldn't, yeah. It was, yeah, dangerous. Stupid. Trying to, trying to kick out. Yeah, stupid trying to kick the ball. Like, I get what he was trying to do, but, yeah. brother, you can't kick. It's like trying to, you remember that, um, the guy that tried to hurdle over, um, over Jared Wadia Hargraves from the Storm, the Fijian winger. Far. Oh, Vunivalu. Vunivalu. He tried to run and jump over Jared. Trying to NFL styles. Trying to NFL styles. I'm like, there's things in the game you just don't do, eh? And it's just dumb, just dumb things. And it's like trying to kick a ball out like Elliot White. I get what he was trying to do, but you miss, you kick him in the face. It's mostly more time. You know what I mean? Yeah. We talk about Jordan Rappin and dare say that uh, Elliot's probably looking at some time as well. I. It wasn't your classic hip drop. I thought he just fell backwards, you know, and fell. Happened to incidentally fall. He didn't drop his weight. Yeah. For mine watching it, it was more a head high tackle than the hip drop. It's just unfortunate that Brandon's got himself badly injured out of it. But I thought all the talk about the hip drop, I didn't think it was actually what you class as a hip drop. He fell over the top and. Just ended up falling on the leg and, and falling in an, an awkward way. But hopefully Brandon gets himself fit again. So, But bad luck for, for Elliot Whitehead. He, he might be looking at some time. When we talk about Jordan Rapino, he's had a great career, been a great Raider. They don't get to go out on their own terms. We'll have to wait and see what the judiciary says about that one. Yeah, um, I think they will go on the extent of the injury. And a lot of the times when it comes to judiciary hearings and gradings, is that if you come out in the media after the game and go, oh, all the media talk about drinking, oh, it looks like an ACL. I think sometimes that's where they grade your grading, say, yeah. before you even watch the game. And, and you say it was more of a head high than anything. I think by the end of the game, everyone kind of thought it was an ACL injury or it's a classic hip drop. Um, I didn't see it as a classic hip drop either. I thought he slipped down as he contacted him high and slipped down on the back leg. Brandon Smith's in an awkward position. Um, unfortunately, he gets an ACL. Now it's become public. The judiciary will watch the game and they'll and they'll just they'll just put a grading out there, and then it'll just be unfortunate for him, but fortunate for Samoa. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got the breaking judiciary has just come out. Oh, uh, okay. Guys. Uh, three Whitehead slept with three different charges. Holy heck. Grade one contrary for the. A kick. I yeah. guess he did a trip. That's another charge. But obviously the one you guys are talking about, grade three dangerous conduct, contact, three to four match ban. So that's season over for him for sure, I think. Yeah, so that comes out, what, this morning? Sometime this morning? Yeah, or it just came out like yeah, so, to go. Yeah, so they, they, they would – I'm guessing they would work um, – you would already have done some work over the weekend for the early games and then they would have worked through the night. But – a lot of this stuff comes out like you already know what the injury is before Monday comes around, you know what I mean? Like people people have context, people know who they're talking to, they know what's going on. So you get a grading. I think I reckon that's a grading due to does he have well, according to um Trent Robinson, he's he's done this his whole <laughs> career. So I'm guessing he's got prior incidents, <laughs> hence why this it's most probably a higher grade. Second offence of this season. So usually... So, so it's, yeah, it's only his second offence. And, and I, I know there was a bit of a blow up there. I watched the media conference afterwards and Trent Robinson, that Elliot came in to apologise. Obviously, Brandon Smith wasn't there because Brandon was getting a scan, which they're very lucky that they can just go straight to get scanned straight after games uh, at the stadium. And he said that, he, I don't think he took his apology sincere. He said, mate, you're, you're, you've done this throughout your career. Uh, the hip drop has just become relevant this year. And you just said it's only his second one, second incident this year when it comes to the hip drop. So that was his first one last time, and this is only his second. So I don't know about that, Willie, about coaches having an opinion on these things, personal opinions on other players and attacks, I think I call them. And the same thing as when Ricky Stewart, it's quite similar to Ricky Stewart when he called um, Salmon a weak-gutted dog. 
Like I don't I don't know if that's the right thing to be saying after games, having a personal attack on a player. Yeah, and to his credit, Trent Robinson's come out this morning and apologised well, for have, his rant. But it, it would have had to. Damages. Like it, it doesn't look like it's bad. It's a bad thing for a coach to comment on players when you know you don't put yourself in those situations to do things on purpose, and you don't know what the extent of the injury is. And all he was doing was apologising, and wanted hopefully it wasn't as bad as what it sounds like it is but a, a opposition coach can't come out and say like he's he's known for over his time in the NRL or over his career he's known for a hip job or you know when it's only his second one this year like I don't I don't feel like that's the right thing to be doing as a coach mm. I'd also say it's kind of a bit rich for Trent Robinson considering two whoa, of whoa, his whoa, are you going there? Uh, I'm just saying just considering two of his players are Jared and uh, Victor Radley. So <laughs> that's all I'm saying. Well, I think one. the fans would say the same yeah. thing, you know what I mean? I think the fans would say, hey, hold on a minute, Trent. Like, you can't be throwing stones at glass houses, mm. you know, is that, hey, besides, <laughs> you know, some of your players, like, you know, you can't be commenting about others as well. So... Yeah, it's unfortunate for um, for Brandon Smith and, and even, uh, what's his name? The half again, just had a mind blank. Sam Walker. Sam Walker. I was going to say Cody Walker then. <laughs> Sam Walker. Like, those, like I think they're a big part of the Roosters. And Sam Walker's, like he said, I think he's been their best player this year. So, um, yeah, it's it's not good for the Roosters. But anyways, I think that's our um, that's our latest episode all done, brother. Round 26 that's, um, Round 26 all done. Um, for all of our fans, uh, make sure we like and subscribe. Uh, tell all your friends and your Fano to come over and get on our YouTube channel and also our TikTok stuff. We did lives every Monday, so make sure you check that out here on Run It Straight. It's Run It Straight on YouTube. Subscribe, like, share, and it's Run It Straight, Run it straight on TikTok as well. So make sure also if you went through this whole segment or all these segments actually you listen to our whole conversation today here on run it straight please comment your sh your greatest sean johnson moment so please get to the end if you can comment your greatest sean johnson moment and we'll let you guys know if you did it or not so thank you so much again appreciate your followers love and share and likes and support let's go